Welcome everyone to St. Luke's Virtual Worship. We're so glad that you joined us, whether you're sitting with your family in Upper Tantalon, or whether you're, well, anywhere really. We discovered last week with our statistics when we saw who watched our service that we had viewers from all across Canada, and even a viewer or two from South America, which was pretty exciting. We never know who we're going to reach, and we're glad that we reached you. If you're looking for uh, updates on what's going on in the church, there is a link on the website to um, the Church at Work. That's our daily or our weekly newsletter to let you know what's going on. Please click there. But other than that, we're glad you're here. We want you to prepare your hearts for worship. Let's just take a moment of silence to listen for the Spirit. sound of the bowl calls us to worship. As we begin our worship today, we remember that we are doing our worship and work on the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We pray that we may continue to do our work and worship in harmony with all the Earth's people and in fairness and justice for everyone. Lent is the church season leading up to Good Friday, the day that Jesus died, when the church repents of its sins. Repent is a word that means to turn around. Sins are those behaviors and habits that separate us from God and from each other. Each week during Lent, we will acknowledge a sin that the Church of Christ has benefited from while others suffer. This week, we repent of our climate change denial. The Bible teaches that we were created to take care of the earth, but we have used the earth in whatever way makes the most money. We have pushed our planet to the limit until the water is full of plastic, until the land is full of toxins, until the air is full of carbon, and the climate has begun to change. God have mercy. But instead of owning up to our responsibility, we have denied that the climate is changing, preferring our economic systems over the good health of the only planet we have. We have used our idea of heaven to justify our misuse of the created world, since it is not our eternal home. Christ, have mercy. We have aligned ourselves with big oil and the status quo, and kept driving our cars and eating our strawberries flown in from California. We have been deaf to the concerns of the poorer parts of the world already beginning to suffer, their islands disappearing into the rising sea. God have mercy. The church has benefited from the sins of climate change denial while others have suffered. And every time one benefits from the suffering of another, a little more light goes out of the world. We repent of the sins of our past, and now that we know better, we ask for God's grace and courage to do better. God, hear our prayer. Thank you. 
Today's readings. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, and it'll be verses 1 to 8, and also verses 24 to 37. Then Exodus, Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. Mark, the destruction of the temple foretold. As he came out of the temple, one of the disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings? Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all of these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lend many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place. But the end is still to come, for a nation will rise upon nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. And then the coming of the Son of Man. But in these days, after the suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from the heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and put forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on his watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cock crow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly, and when I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. At Exodus. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. And may God add a blessing to this reading.
That's great, it starts with an earthquake. Bird snakes and aeroplane. Yeah, Lenny Bruce is not afraid. Not afraid. I have a hurricane, listen to yourself, churn worlds of zone needs. Don't miss of your own needs. Speed it up on ox speed, front, no strength, no ladder, start to clatter with the pier of height, down height, wire and a fire, representing seven games in a government for hire and a combat site. Left the West and coming in a hurry with the furies beating down your neck. Team by team reports battle Trump, Trevor Crop, look at that low plane, fine then. Uh oh, overflow population, common group, what it'll do. Savers off, service off, worlds, there's no needs. Listen to your heart bleed with the rapture and the reverend in the right. Right, you vitriolic, patriotic, slam fight, bright light, feeling pretty sight. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. And I feel fine. Six o'clock TV hour, don't get cut in foreign towers, slash and burn, return, listen to yourself, churn, lock him in, uniform, book, burning, blood, letting every mode of escalate, automotive, incinerate, light a candle, light a motor, step down, step down, watch, heel, crush, crush, oh, this means no fear, cavalier, renegade, and steering clear, tournament, a tournament, tournament of lies, offer me solutions, offer me alternatives, and I decline. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. The other night I dreamed of an ice continental drift divide, not sit in a line, Leonard Bernstein, Leonard and British Neville, Lenny Bruce and Lester Banks, pretty party cheesecake, jelly bean boom, you symbiotic patriotic slam, but neck right, right. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's time I had some time alone. It's time I had some time alone. I feel fine. Ever heard the old saying, I'll rest when I'm dead? It kind of came up in our, in our house this week. And I guess it may not be all that funny when you consider some of the stuff that's going on around the world right now. Some of the pictures we've getting out of New York City and some of that sort of stuff. But I do think that it is a phrase that sums up as well as, as anything how our society looks at rest. It's something you, you, you just don't stop. We have elevated hard work to be the greatest good in our society. We, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever, you probably know the one where you're, you're driving by the construction site and there's three guys standing around and they're all leaning on their shovels and all we sit, and uh, the comments that we say in the car on the way by may not be kind. I, I think it's along a lot, I think what's happening is that people think that's my public dollars at work and if I'm paying you, you better be busy. Never mind what they just did with the, with the shovels five minutes before we arrived. Every moment we need to fill, because if we don't fill the moment, we're not being productive. I remember some years ago um, talking to a coworker, and she was describing her children, and she said they were very good at lounging. And the vitriol she put in the word lounging said words like way big volumes past anything I could say right here. I can't even quite do it. The contempt in her voice was epic. One of the nastiest things we can say in this culture is to call somebody lazy. And I think this is all a joke that Benjamin Franklin played on us. Do you remember Benjamin Franklin, the guy out flying the kite? in the thunderstorm to prove that electricity was a thing. A very lucky man that he did not get electrocuted right there and then. Um, but instead he lived and became one of the great founders of the, uh, of the United States. And I think he even signed the, signed the Declaration of Independence. 
Well, Benjamin Franklin is famous about that, but another thing he's famous about is that he is considered by many to be the author of the modern Protestant work ethic. And the idea of the Protestant work ethic, it comes out of a combination of Puritan thinking and um, Calvinist thinking. The idea being that um, you needed, in order to be a good Christian, you needed to be modest, you needed to not take any luxuries at all, you needed to live a very ascetic lifestyle, and you needed to work hard. And so basically what that means is if you are not spending any of your money on luxuries and you're working very hard, you're going to tend to accumulate wealth. And people who come from that Calvinist tradition that was put forward tend to save money instead of spend it. The nest egg becomes the great good and the sign of your virtue because that shows that you have been very frugal and also very hardworking. And what Benjamin Franklin said was that he believed from those two traditions that the pursuit of profit for its own sake was a good thing. It was okay to, to put all your efforts towards working hard and building up a profit. That was inherently good. And uh, Ben Franklin was actually a noted atheist in his time. And I think that's why he had to say that profit was inherently good, because he didn't believe in a godly virtue the way that many of the people at those days did. So I've often thought of the Protestant work ethic, which is attributed to Benjamin Franklin, is, is that atheist joke on the church. He kind of got us all working real hard, real hard, and then, ha ha, look at you guys go, right? Man, have we worked that angle, that profit by itself is an inherent good. We have worked and worked and worked some more. We have worked like our lives depended on it. And then, suddenly, like it said in the reading that Brian just read for us, we did not know the appointed hour. Suddenly, all that work stopped. We were told to go home and stay home. We were told that our lives depended on not working. And here we are at the end of our world. Rest has been imposed on us. And we've been working so hard for so long, I don't think we know how to do it anymore. I'll get back to our situation in a few minutes. But first, I want to say a couple of words about the scripture passages. The first passage that was read from the Gospel of Mark is the little apocalypse of Mark. The it's, uh, it's Jesus teaching about the end of the world. And I want to just let you know that we picked out that passage to do this Sunday a month and a half ago. We had no idea that the end of our world was com coming down. But then when this is what happened, we said, okay, let's just go with it. An apocalypse, stories about the, the end times or the end of the world, is a type of writing that started up uh, amongst the Hebrew people after they came back from their exile in Babylon. Their city had been destroyed, had been razed to the ground. They were in exile for 75 years and then came home back to their city, believing the whole time that all they had to do was rebuild and everything would be amazing. It would be perfect. God would practically live with them and and all people would go back to the good behavior that until now they, they were not displaying. So guess what happened? People were people, and they did not go back to the good behavior. They still cared too much about the values of the surrounding culture and not enough about what God was, was asking them to do. They still were unjust to the widows and the orphans. So after a few years of that, maybe a hundred years of that, another idea came up in Israel, which was to say, if we're going to ever make the world fair and just, God has to end history and come down and be our ruler here on earth. And when God is our ruler here on earth, that's when things will finally be fair. And so apocalypse is a is, a, is a, a genre or a type of writing in the book that we see the book of Daniel's like that. Um, you, you already know about the book of Revelation, which comes from a little later than Jesus' time. But John the Baptist was an apocalyptic teacher, 
teaching that the end of the world was at hand. And we believe that Jesus learned the end time stories from John. And so this piece of story, although it's put at the end of Mark's gospel, may actually have been teachings from the beginning of Jesus' ministry before he thought everything all the way through. He was still teaching that the world was about to end and God was going to come down and fix things. We think that as his ministry went on later, what he started teaching instead was the kingdom of God is already here. It's already here and it's inside you. And if you want the kingdom of God to be on earth, you have to get it out of you and into the world. Which is a teaching that I'm much more comfortable with and like a lot better. But I do think that this teaching about the kingdom of God when God will live on earth speaks to profoundly to people who are oppressed or living in injustice. Because if things are really going badly for you and your crowd, what you will want more than anything is for the current situation to end so that things can get better for you. And if you're at the top, if you're the king or the king's courtiers or those people who benefit from, from the uh, power and the influence of the king, the last thing you want is for the world to end. And so apocalypse literature has always been there. Uh, it's sort of as a, as, as a powerful literature of the underdog. Whenever you're the underdog, that's what you're looking for. My problem sometimes with this kind of literature is that in times of persecution, it can become a kind of a revenge fantasy. The idea being that, okay, when God comes down, it's like, you know, when the kids are, are fighting and then the one kid turns to the other one and says, just wait till dad gets here. That's sometimes how I think we treat apocalyptic literature. The idea being that, that, um, that God's going to come down, God is going to take my enemies by the scruff of the neck, toss them into the boiling pit of lava, and oh, it's going to feel so good to watch them go. I don't know. I don't know about that. I think that's probably not where I want to go, but I think I really, really identify some days with the apocalyptic feeling that goes basically, stop the world, I want to get off. Maybe you're there today. And if you are, God bless you. And we're going to do our best to sit with you through those feelings. Stop the world I want to get off, I think, is a statement of a profound desire for rest. Stuff has gotten too much. I need a break. I need a rest. And there is a tradition of rest in the Bible. It's called Sabbath. Every seven days, everybody is supposed to take a do-nothing day. The ancient Hebrews understood that humans were not created to go, 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 go 24-7. They understood that everybody, to, in order to function, needs some time to just let it all go, to reset, to, to get your reserves back, to make another assault at what your daily life really is. We need to rest. And I think even more than that, the Bible understands that we need rules to make us rest. We kind of need boundaries around that rest. I can tell you for sure uh, that, that my last 10 days have not included a rest day. Because there's always another thing to do in this new church we're trying to create and get online presence and, and figure out how to meet. And, and every day there's been something else to do. And I've not been resting. And I'm going to take my own advice when this is over and go take a day off, I promise. And if you're one of those people who's trying extra hard to hold it together, especially I'm thinking about the young parents where two parents are trying to work and two kids are going off the walls and not allowed to, to be with your friends, take a rest day. You know, do something you love to do together and pay some attention to each other. You may find that you can't live without it. Now, I don't want to say that COVID-19 was part of God's plan to make us rest. I don't have the idea of a God who, who, who zaps us to make things happen. I don't think it works like that at all. And not only that, but to take something like COVID-19 where there's going to be so much misery and loss in this time and say it's all part of God's plan, I think that's kind of monstrous. And I think we need to not go there. 
But what I do believe is in every situation of difficulty and suffering that God gives, or that, that the world gives us, that, that comes to us as it comes to everybody eventually, there is some learning in there that God is hoping we receive. I think the learning has been there all along, but sometimes we learn best when we've got a difficulty to learn it against. And maybe, just maybe, this is one of those difficulties that we can learn some things about. One big thing I think we need to learn is how to stop and rest. I've been spending way too much time on Facebook the well, last little while, because what do you do when you're home and that's where all your friends are? I think it was one day, maybe not even that, maybe 12 hours before the first posts were coming back from people going, I can't do this! I'm going nuts! I can't even get out of my house! I'm, I learned a new word for it. Um, one I had not heard before, um, maybe my correspondents could tell me if this is a particular word to the Maritimes that I never heard before, but it's called shack wacky. <laughs> I've now heard it on CBC, I've heard it from one of my parishioners. It is such a great word, I, I, I think I'm just going to go with that. People were going shack wacky. Um, parents going, how am I going to homeschool these kids? I am so not ready for this. Um, people going, um, my bookstores are closed, what do I do now? I didn't get enough supplies before. I know that I personally took two trips to craft stores before they closed them down, because I wanted to make sure I had enough stuff to do while I was gone. We were all on enforced rest, and we did not like it. Not one little bit. We have all been trained to be busy. More than that, we've been trained to believe that our worth is how busy we are. When we ask people, how are you, and they say busy, it's like a sign of pride. And now, we're not so busy. So the next thing that came up after a little bit of that kind of, I don't know how I'm going to cope from this, is all my craft friends, and I did this actually, posting pictures of their projects. Hey, this is awesome. I'm going to be off for so long. My favorite statement that I saw on the internet was, was um, it was a sort of a question and answer format. It's a, like fabric worker going, wow, I can get so much crafting done, or so much sewing done. And, and the person says, so what if it happens if you run out of supplies? And if you're a crafter, you know the answer was, oh, ha, 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 run out of supplies. <laughs> Yeah, I've got enough to sew probably for the next 20 years. Um, my knitting will probably only keep me for a year, maybe a year and a half. So here we are now, all lining up our craft projects and putting pictures of what we've accomplished and all that kind of stuff, because we've got to be busy. We've got to get stuff done. We don't even need a boss to tell us to keep busy. We've internalized the message. Here's my best advice for a time when so much of our world has shut down. You will not be judged in this time on the basis of what you did not accomplish. You don't have to be the world's perfect crafter or perfect home educator or perfect visitor. That's not what we're on about at this point. Instead, I advise you to spend your time learning how to rest. This might be a new skill. But, you know, if it's new to you, it's something we can practice. When I say practice, I mean gently. Not, no taking on meditation like the world depends on your ability to meditate. No, no, no. Quiet time. Checking in with your body to see how it's doing. How about taking a walk and listening to the birds sing? Spring has not been canceled. Just as long as you do it at a pleasant distance from everybody else of two meters, I think it's still there ready for you to enjoy. Play silly games with your kids. I had a friend yesterday whose birthday it was, and uh, so what she decided to do was have a party on Facebook. It was a party together alone. And what she said is, post pictures of the cake and the drinks you have had in my honor, and party, silly party hats are good. 
And so we got pictures of everybody's silly party hats. You know, that sounds like a great idea. Let's not take this too seriously. I think one of the things that our world is about to discover is that most of the stuff we have been doing in all of our busy work hasn't actually been all that important. We can work without having to commute every day. That crazy moment of trying to get all the kids ready at the same time as the parents and get out without anyone actually screaming at each other. We can, most of the stuff that we buy, we don't need. Kids still have more fun playing with an empty box or a stick than they have at their structured after-school activities. We can learn how to pause in our work from time to time and rest, and the world does not actually end. And if we can, we can learn how to rest. If we can learn how to rest individually, maybe the other thing we can learn is how to give our world a rest. I was struck, as I said last week, by the pictures out of China showing the, the yellow arms of pollution from Be reaching out from Beijing in January and then pictures in March with it all gone. And the canals in Venice, clear and full of fish for the first time in as long as anyone can remember, actually. And I'm thinking if all the commuters stay home and most of the supply trucks stay home and, and, and we don't actually keep consuming the way we've been consuming, what, what kind of rest would that be for our Earth? I think signs are showing it's going to be pretty good, actually. If you think all the way back to September, when the kids protested for climate change at the end of September, I and my kids walked in that parade there were 10,000 people plus in downtown Halifax and more all over the country saying things have to change and we need to start giving some things up if we want to keep our planet healthy. And the powers that be gave lip service to the kids' demands, but basically things went on as if nothing had changed because there's no way we can bring our commerce to a stop to be able to save our planet. And then our health was at risk, the health of people like you and I. The number of world leaders that are coming down with this virus, is, the news is increasing every day. And suddenly when it's our lives that are at stake individually, our lives in our place, we can bring the world to a stop. So one of my really hopeful things, and I am holding on to this deeply, is that when this is all over, the credibility of those who say we cannot shut down our economic engine for the sake of our planet will have been proved wrong. Because even our Earth needs a Sabbath rest. And this virus-imposed rest may actually show us the way. When we start up again, the kids will no longer believe us when we say we can't. And like the black slaves in America who sang about the old world ending and the new world beginning, because when the old world meant slavery and the new world meant freedom, the end of the world didn't seem so bad. I also hope for the end of the old world and the beginning of the new one, where the old one meant profit at all costs, and the new one means Sabbath rest from time to time and a new environment healing from the damage we have done. My Lord, what a morning indeed. Amen.
And at St. Luke's United Church in Tantalan, we have a wonderful church family. And we hug and we talk and we listen and we sing and we pray and we cry and we bump elbows and we touch toes and we worship online if that's what we have to do. We are so grateful that you are here with us today. As we join together in prayer, we will become, uh, we'll reach the Lord's Prayer that we'll say together. And when we do that, it will begin with our Father Mother. Please join me in prayer. O oh God, we thank you that in Christ you call each of us by name and unite us in his body, your church. Give us love enough to make a difference in your world and trust enough to follow even when the way before us is a challenge. O oh God of peace and promise, in Christ, you call us to love our enemies and to be peacemakers of the world you love. We pray today for people in places divided by ancient bitterness and current hostility. Especially today, we bring to you families that are known to us and are at odds with one another. O oh God of the bruised and broken, we are grateful that in Christ you have taken up the cross and know by heart the things that bring us suffering and pain. We pray today for all those in need of healing and comfort, whatever their source of pain. And so we name to you, Hazel Krant, Denny Olson, Nancy Bolio, Dean Martin, Jane McKenzie, Eileen Hirschman, Alberta and Carson Cook, Marissa Balzer, Jacqueline Richard, Lorraine Grandy, Catherine O'Handley, Julie Tingley, Brian Lehman, Laura Lee and Linda Green. The many reaching ministries of the Freedom Renewal Center, the private prayers of the Annis Circle Group, and those walking in or through or with a journey of suicide, breast cancer, infertility, leukemia, ALS, autism, dementia, depression, domestic violence, and of course the many concerns that we hold secret in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy and in your perfect time, hear and answer these prayers. O oh God of the lonely and sorrowing, in Christ you face the loss we know when loved ones die or when friends let us down. We remember, we remember before you those who grieve the loss of their beloved and those who face a lonely future. In these days of COVID-19, we pray especially for those whose day starts with anxiety as they leave the security of home worrying about the risk of infection, particularly those whose health or age classifies them as vulnerable. Loving God, be close. Keep them safe, along with all whose daily tasks include the care of frail or elderly. And for all of us, grant us wisdom to make sensible choices, not just for ourselves, but for each other. When this day is over, when this time is over, may we never take for granted a handshake, full shelves in the grocery stores, face-to-face -face conversations, the taste of communion, coffee with a friend, a routine checkup, the morning rush for the school bus, each deep breath that we are able to take. When this is over, May we find that we have become more like the people you wanted us to be, more like the people we were called to be, more like the people we hope to be. And then, may we stay that way, better for each other and better for you. We say all of these things in and through the name of Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now I pray for you all the benefits of rest. I pray that you may continue to find community in your isolation and that you may know that wherever you are and whatever you are doing, God is there. And may the living Christ go with you. May he go behind you to support you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over you, within you to empower you, and ahead of you to show you the way Amen.